Glad to see you guys here today. Let's pray before we get into the word. Father, I thank you so much that you are with us. One of the promises that you have given to us is that you will never leave us or forsake us. And Lord, we don't want to take for granted that you are here in this room, that you are with us. And I pray, Lord, today as we go through your word, that matchless thing that has been preserved through the ages, that which will endure even after all of this is gone. I pray that you might help us to see your will in it for our lives, that you might help us to be more like you, that we wouldn't repeat the mistakes of those in the past that have gone before us, that truly everything that you have written down for us is for our learning. I pray that you help us to learn for all of the distractions and the places where our minds would go and the troubles of our lives and of the day and of this world. We lay at your feet, Lord. We pray that you would superintend all of the words and everything that we do here today, that we would glorify you in everything that is our desire to honor you in all that we do. So I pray that you help us to do that now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so you guys don't need to know, we're back in the book of Genesis. We're in chapter 27, which is this very interesting passage about stealing God's favor. Stealing God's favor. Yes, I selected those words very carefully. Is it possible to steal God's favor? No one with a theological background wishes to stand up because I trap people, and you know that I enjoy that. It is impossible to steal God's favor, although you can't accept it. So we'll, we'll talk about that. We've been looking at, in the past, the life of Abraham and his offspring as we went through we see Jacob and Esau, two very different twins. One came out red and hairy, and so they called him Harry. I wouldn't advise you do that. If they come out looking squinched, don't call them that. Um, and Jacob, Jacob who comes out after him, and he's the second born, and they call him Jacob because he's a heel catcher. He's a supplanter. He's somebody that trips you up. Uh, he's a deceiver. So all of those things are incorporated with his name, and he certainly lives up to it here in this next episode as we go through. We looked at how they went, and, and Isaac went and dug a well, and people came in and took it over, and he dug another well, and they took it over, and finally he dug a well, and there was peace. He's like, the Lord has made room for us, and he named it Rehoboth, which is uh, uh, the Lord has given us room to grow. And after that, he leaves, and he goes somewhere else, and he digs a place, and the Lord meets with him there, and that's where he ends up staying. So we learn a lesson. You can go anywhere, and the Lord will profit you. You can go anywhere, and the Lord can get you a job. You can go anywhere and, you know, be planted, but it's not necessarily where God would have you to be if his presence isn't with you. And so I, I learned a lesson. It's best to go where the Lord wants you to go, because everything else is worthless if he's not in it. Amen? Amen. So we... We looked at how all these things were written for our learning and how Isaac's way of deciding what God wanted to do was just when it got uncomfortable, leave. And if it gets uncomfortable, leave. And if it's comfortable, that must be where God is, but it's not always the case, is it? Just because it's comfortable. And sometimes we use that as a gauge. We use circumstance as a gauge to say, well, this is what God wants me to do because I'm comfortable here. The Lord has called any number of people out from their um, lazy boys to get up and go someplace that he will show them. And that's where we find the fantastic life of living as a sojourner with the Lord, where all of these wonderful, exciting things that he reveals, we get to see. Um, I wouldn't be here if I didn't listen to him at some point and come. So this week, we're going to look at stealing God's favor, which is the story of Jacob and Esau. And we've already looked at their life and their interaction and their parents and their favoritism and all of the dysfunctional family stuff that they have. Is it amazing to you to see all the dysfunction in the scriptures? It, it makes you feel a little less like you're on the Jerry Springer show because, you know, Jerry Springer's got nothing on these people in the Bible. I got news for you. Beginning in chapter 27, verse 1, it reads this way. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau his older son, and said to him, my son. And he answered him, here I am. And then he said, behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. 
Now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and make me savory food such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, and that my soul may bless you before I die. This is kind of a conference of a will, if you will, and he's not dead yet. And he goes, I don't know when I'm going to die, but it could be any moment. So why don't you get me some of that good food that I enjoy? It's one of those things that a father and son in this story share is this love for food. In fact, Esau loves food so much, he's willing to sell, sell his spiritual birthright to his brother for a bowl of lentil soup because he cares nothing for spiritual things. He cares nothing to be the, the head of the family, to be the priest and the leader of the home. He's got no interest in that. I'm hungry, give me food, you can have everything else. All I want is, is good food. I can relate. <laughs> the flesh is one of those things that Esau is certainly a picture of, isn't he? He's more interested in the meal right now than he is in any sort of a future goal or any sort of a spiritual inheritance or anything else. It's all about now and here. And boy, don't we live in a world like that? It's about instant gratification. It's not about anything spiritual or anything in the future. It's, uh, it's, it's how we get into trouble in the stock market, but I digress. Isaac's failed eyesight did not mean that he was dying. He was 137. He would live 43 more years. So he's saying, you know, I don't know when I'm going to die, but I think you should get hunting because I'm feeling a little rumble. And he's going to live another 43 years. Doesn't it sound a little suspicious to you? Have you ever been manipulated by someone? I, I learned from the best and I can smell it a mile away. Oh, I have all these dishes to do and no one to help me. I'm not talking about my wife. I'm talking about my mother, okay? Uh, this thing is broken and I don't know what to do. I look at her and go, oh, you got a problem. And I walk away because I know what she's doing. She's playing me. Have you never been played? You know, or you have a passive aggressive father, you know, says, the lawn's looking long out there. Why don't you just ask me to cut the lawn? It's simple, right? Instead, you got to play a game. Have you never done this? Have you never been part of this little give and take, this guilt trip sort of passive aggressive manipulation? Well, that's what I, I'm kind of smelling a little of that going on over here. He's going to live another 43 years. He's not dead. Just because your eyes are weak doesn't mean you're dead. And just because your eyes are weak doesn't give you a reason to give up and quit life, right? So whatever it is that you lost that you don't have since you were 18 years old doesn't give you a right to quit life. Okay? Sorry, that just came to me standing here. Because I have certain things I can't do and doesn't mean I should quit. Anyway, so why is Isaac doing this? Wasn't this the birthright that belongs to Jacob? We know from two sources. Number one, there was a vision or a dream that Rebecca had in answer to prayer where God came and said... You have two nations in your room. That's why everything's rumbling around in there. And the older will serve the younger, which means the younger one's going to get the birthright blessing, not the older, as is tradition. So that was prophesied before they were ever born. Secondly, well, I'll leave that. It belongs to Jacob. And the second time, Jacob actually bought it, right, for a bowl of soup. He saw despised his birthright. He didn't want anything to do with it. And so we have two Really good assurances that Esau's not in the running for this blessing, and yet he's getting blessed by his father. His father does this not in a family council. He's doing it on the side, like, hey, go get me some food, and I'll, uh, you know, I'll give you the blessing. Because Esau's his favorite, and he's going to treat him with favor. Didn't Esau despise his birthright and sell it for soup? Of course he did. And isn't his father doing something similar? For a meal, I'll give you the blessing. It, it's, it's an interesting thing. Well, you're going to see a lot of things come back on Jacob. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I, I go fast forward and I realize I have to drag you all with me. 
Esau is a picture of the flesh, a man who lived in his immediate appetite and not for future spiritual blessings. There is another acclaimed mighty hunter before the Lord in the scriptures. You know who that is? Nimrod. Nimrod, who was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and he was a picture of the flesh in the world too. So it's interesting as you see, you go through the scriptures and you find this kind of th thread that goes through and you find these very similar symbols. Um, so he was also a mighty hunter. So we see the picture of the two of them. Um, we remember the day that Jacob actually was the hunter and Esau was the prey and he got the birthright from him or at least the word of it. It's interesting that Esau was unsatisfied in his hunting. Here's this great hunter and apparently he didn't get anything. And so who did he turn to for help? He turned to Jacob. Jacob says, give me some of that soup that you have. I'm going to die. Well, would you give me your birthright? You could have it. I don't care. I'm going to die if I don't have that soup. And he sells his birthright, or at least he gives his word, which means nothing from somebody who doesn't keep their word. But it's interesting that Esau was unsatisfied with his life in the field and his immediate appetite wasn't fulfilled. And Jacob ends up being the one who he goes to to get his appetite fulfilled. You know, as a Christian, you're going to find people that hate your guts because you love the Lord. Those will be the same people that when they're going through a hard time, they will seek you out and say, would you pray for me? Because the world will not satisfy them in the real deep desires and aches of their heart. And they'll come to you, much like you went to Jacob. I saw that last night. I just thought it was interesting. So, against God's expressed will, Isaac is favoring Esau. He's going to bless Esau and give him this inheritance. It's like carrying out the will. And he's going to do this against what God has shown and expressed in more than one occasion. And he knows this. But because he's his favorite, he's going to try to steal God's favor for Esau. Right? You guys are following the story, right? Good, because I'm trying to, I'm really working hard here. Isaac has a strong attachment to his appetite as well and will sneak in a blessing for a special last meal. I'll trade you this for this, even though he has no right really to give it because God said you're not going to give it to him. He is not near death as he imagines, and so the menu request seems contrived and manipulative. I'm, I'm, I know I'm analyzing. That's not really a word. Such clandestine behavior belies a strongly dysfunctional family dynamic where trust is neither sought after nor even hoped for. Basically, there are no heroes here. There are no heroes in this story. Rebecca is no hero. Jacob's no hero. Esau is not a hero, and neither is Isaac. All of them are fleshly. And I wish I could say, you know, here's a good thing about someone, except the whole story is a family where no one trusts anyone. There are favorites, and everybody's trying to make something happen that shouldn't be happening. And it's just contrived. I hope you don't have a family, anything like this. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it in. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make me savory food for me, that I may eat of it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. It's a very demanding woman. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves, and you shall take it to your father, that he may eat it and that he may bless you before his death. Sneaky people. We're going to steal God's favor and we're going to make sure that what God said originally is going to happen against what dad says. We're going to do it by deception. How do you steal God's favor and how do you do it by deceiving an old man who's blind? How heartless is that? How heartless is that? Not to mention this is your father and your husband. So Isaac is not even dead and they're already arguing over the will. That's really what's happening here. They're arguing over who's going to get the double portion, who's going to be in control of the family, family finances, who's going to be the one who has the right to do that. So deceit and subterfuge is unparalleled in this exhibition, exhibition of avarice and favoritism. I, was, I, I felt like I was doing a, a, I was reading and being a critic of a book 
of a story, and I was writing this out, and I used way too many big words. It was very late. Sorry. But they're deceiving and undermining to get their own way, each, each other, and it's just terrible self-centeredness and favoritism. And is there any possibility that venison tastes like goat? <laughs> going to take some goats, going to prepare them the way dad likes. Maybe he likes a lot of spices. Maybe in addition to his eyes, maybe COVID's taken his taste away. So we don't know. But I'm not sure that goat tastes like venison um, unless you spice it up really good and then it just tastes like spice. So she's going to try to deceive him in so many different ways, try to feed him venison when it's really goat, to try to get a blessing for her favorite son instead of Esau. And they're on the clock now. They've got to hurry because see Esau went out and he's on his way. And he's a mighty hunter. So he could come back at any moment. So we're under the gun. This is, this is like uh, the born identity, it's, you know. <laughs> Now Jacob and Rebekah, his mother, said to Rebekah, his mother, look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall be seen as a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. That's the way I imagine him saying But his mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son, only obey my voice and go. Get them for me. And he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory food such as his father loved. And then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids, of the goats, on his hands and on his smooth part of his neck. No, ooh. Okay. <laughs> then she gave the savory food and the bread, which she had prepared into the hand of her son, Jacob. Notice Jacob's not doing any of this. He's just saying, okay, mommy. Okay, mommy. Don't do that. It's not a good idea. He should have stood up like a man and said, mom, this is wrong. Let's just go talk to dad. But no, we got to kill animals and take their flesh their bloody flesh and put it on your neck and on your arms. So it seems like you're Esau. Like, what are you going to do about the voice? I'll talk like this. <laughs> Hi, I'm Esau. You know, I'm Jacob. He's not, he's going to know right away. I sound like Michael Jackson. You know, so <laughs> it's just not, although they're twins, they're not twins. So fear, Fear of how something may appear to others or the threat of being caught seems to be his only motive for lack of enthusiasm. Jacob is all for this and he decides to do it as long as I don't get caught. As long as I don't get caught. Because he'll think I'm a deceiver. By the way, what's his name? Deceiver. deceiver. Yeah, his name is Deceiver. Everyone knows he's a deceiver. He's already been hustling people. He's a deceiver. He doesn't want to be seen for who he really is. A deceiver. He's more concerned about how it appears than how it really is. That's the difference between being a hypocrite and having character. Character means you do what's right regardless of anybody who looks or however it looks to anyone else. That's character. Worrying about how, oh no, they're going to think badly of me or I'm going to look like a deceiver. No, you are a deceiver. That's why you would look like a deceiver because you're deceiving. I don't know what else you call yourself when you're deceiving. Deceiver. So he's like a sheep in wolf's clothing. He's got to go there all, all dressed up and, and pretend that he's uh, his brother when he's not. Notice what she says when he, he brings a protestation. Let your curse be on me, my son. That sounds so familiar. Do you remember when Jesus and Barabbas were before the people? Yep. And Pilate was really, really, really trying to let Jesus go because he found him innocent and even said, I find nothing wrong with this man. He is innocent. And he washed his hands in front of him, in front of all the people and say, listen, uh, it's that time of year when I'm supposed to release somebody like a scapegoat, like you Jews do. And so I'm going to release somebody. Do you want this guy who was an accused murderer, Barabbas, or do you want Jesus? And the crowd got all whipped up and were crying for Barabbas, a man of the flesh. And it's interesting. In verse 
24 and 25 of Matthew 27, it says, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that the tumult was rising, he took water and he washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and our children. Now that's taking responsibility, at least for your actions, isn't it? Except that is one heck of a thing to take responsibility for, is the denial of the Christ who was sent specifically to the people of Israel. And these are the Pharisees who are crying this out and getting the, getting the crowd all whipped up. Let the guilt be on us and our children. And it, and it wasn't 40 years later, the temple in Jerusalem fell to the ground and there was not one stone left upon another. Judgment fell. And it was on them and their children. Verse 18, and so he went to his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? So there was a doubt as to who it was. Jacob said to his father, uh, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit up and eat my game, for your soul will bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He's suspicious. Then he said, well, be because the Lord God brought it to me. We call that a lie. And he's using God's name in a lie. This is deep. This is deep. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. You get it. Dad understands what's going on here. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and he said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. And so he blessed him. So dad was suspicious a couple of times, asked for a couple of proofs. He comes near, he feels the hairy goat skin and goes, yeah, that's Esau, all right? A hairy goat skin. How hairy was this guy? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he's sitting there, and if he's like you or me, he's feeling conviction. Oh, no, I shouldn't be doing this. I feel wrong. I'm lying to my blind father and telling him I'm, uh, I'm Esau, and I'm not Esau, and he's up to me. He knows what's going on. Mom made me do it. If he catches me and he grabs me by the lip or something, I'm going to have to confess and say, Mom made me do it. Or maybe he would say, God made me do it. Because I'm supposed to be getting the blessing anyway, and so this is the only way I could do is connive it and grab it and steal it. Wow. Wow. Or maybe Esau made me do it because he's not giving me, he told me he would give me his birthright and he didn't do it. You know, I have no idea. Or maybe he felt he had to do it. I don't know what excuses you might come up with as to why you feel you need to step into deceive, deceiving people or be sinful, but none of them are, are good excuses at all, are they? It's better to just be honest. You'll have the blessing of God if you're honest and do what he tells you to do. So it's a little like, come here, my son. Let me see. You're, you're bigger than I remember. And then he said, a third time, are you really my son Esau? And he said, I, I am. And he said, bring it near to me and I will eat my son's game so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. And then his father Isaac said to him, uh, come near now and kiss me, my son. It's the fourth question. He's, he's really having a hard time believing this, this kid is Esau, right? And so I can imagine mom standing in the background and saying, don't, don't confess. Don't say a word. Just keep, just, just do what he says. Let him kiss you. Okay. It's all right. Jacob is living up to his name, isn't he? Maybe that's why God changes his name because he lives up to his name. I hope you have a good name. I hope you live up to your name. And if you have a rotten name, I hope you live it down. 
We'll give you a new one. We'll call you Bruno or something. This is what it looks like when we come before God without realizing our own unworthiness and we seek him to bless our self-centered willfulness. You ever think that you might be like Jacob coming to God and saying, Lord, I want you to bless me. I want you to do this and that and the other thing for me. He goes, you know, we need to talk about some things first. Like what's going on with this? You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really don't deserve you to answer any of my prayers. The Lord says, I love you. You know I love you. What about this? Can we talk about that? And that's the way the Lord is. He never, he never beats you up. He never gives you an angry look. He's not standing there with a lightning bolt saying, oh, I ought to. It's none of that. And I just see a picture of myself sometimes when I come before God on behalf of other people. And the Lord says, what are you doing? Are you going to try to perform ministry in this current state? And it helps me to deal with those things. Amen. When God seeks intimacy and we're trying to be something more than what we truly are, I think there's a more appropriate response. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That's a prayer of David when he got busted and Nathan the prophet went and spoke to him. That should be the response of our hearts when we come before God because he's not blind and he's not dumb and he knows what's going on. And when we come before him, we shouldn't pretend to be something we're not. We should come to him to become something that Jesus died for us to become. And so verse 27, he came near and he kissed him and he smelled the smell of his clothing. You know, people put off a scent and it's not Ralph Lauren Producing your own scent is a very different thing. And what do you think he smells like? He smells like a man. He smells like sweat and grit and dew and a tent when you've left it too long wet. <laughs> Smelled his clothing and blessed him and said, surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you the dew of heaven. Uh, that's water, which is the most essential thing for human life. Of the fatness of the earth. By the way, that's not saying something bad. Fatness is a good thing. Uh, where's David Loyley when you need him? <laughs> and plenty of grain and wine. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. By the way, this is getting very prophetic, is it not? Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. You know, he's talking about Jacob. Cursed be everyone who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. So the father, Isaac, gives this blessing to Jacob, not knowing it's Jacob, thinking it's Esau. Can you steal a blessing just that simple by going to an old man? I appreciate your silence. The blessing here echoes the covenant given by Abraham and places Jacob over his older brother as the priest and the leader of his family line. This is a conference. This is like a will. Now, you didn't have to put your hand under his thigh like the other guy did, but this is a binding contract that he's making, even though he's being deceived. This is how the things worked back then. 
Accepting God's favor is different from forcing it. God promised it. Esau despised it. Jacob took it. And Rebekah manipulated it. And Isaac granted it reluctantly to the unintended recipient. But God used it to accomplish his will. What a mess. Like I said, there are no heroes in the story. And everybody, by subterfuge and deception and lying and pretending that goat is really venison, I mean, every part of it is just wrong. And yet, God uses it. Does that sound familiar? It's one of my favorite passages in Romans 8, 28. And we know, we don't guess, we don't think, we don't imagine. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. God will take whatever mess it is that you've made, whatever stack of sins it is that you've accumulated, and he will use it for good for you. I find that amazing. God recycles my junk better than anybody does here on earth with plastic. He takes even our shortcomings, our weaknesses, our flat out rebellion to him and he uses it for good because he makes us into the image of Jesus Christ. And then at the end of it, we have nothing to boast about, do we? That's the way he wants it. He wants us to see ourselves as we truly are and he wants us to come to him as a savior. Amen? Amen. I'm so glad we have one. Verse 30. Now it happened, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also had made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. What's he after? The blessing. What's he want? The cash. He wants a double portion of everything. He doesn't, he doesn't give a rip about it when he's hungry, but suddenly dad starts talking about dying. He's going to grab it with both hands. So he says, get up so I can feed you and you can bless me. That's the Jersey vernacular. <laughs> and his father Isaac said to him, who are you? He's a little confused. So he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. And then Isaac trembled exceedingly <laughs> and said, who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came and I have blessed him. And indeed, he shall be blessed. What just happened? Isaac realized he's been duped. He's been lied to and he's been duped and he blessed Jacob, which is what God wanted anyway. He ended up doing the right thing, even though he was deceived into doing it. And Jacob did the wrong thing by doing it. And his mother, Rebecca, did the wrong thing. And yet the right thing happened because that's what God wanted to happen. And I think at this point he realizes, wow, wow. I was fighting God and God won. And he trembled. It says he convulsed in the original language. He convulsed violently. He's like, oh no, I just messed up. Not because he gave the blessing to the wrong kid, but because he gave the blessing to the right one, but he didn't want to. Isaac was shaken up because God fixed him and got him to do the right thing regardless of all of his motives. And so now Esau's there, who I, I, I picture, you know, he went hunting on his Harley and came back. And now he's ready for a blessing and dad just realized I blessed the right kid wrongly. It's scary. Esau heard the words of his father and cried I don't know if you've seen a large grown man cry, but it's disturbing. It's kind of like a very large old person running. It, there's something wrong there. 
he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, me also, oh my father. But he said, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. You see, he knew who it was immediately. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright and look, now he has taken away my blessing. The blessing, by the way, confers the birthright. So they're connected. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed, I have made him your master. And all his brethren I have given to him as servants with grain and wine. I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, oh, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Wow, that's a heart-wrenching thing. And he says, listen, I gave it away. God gave me one. I gave it away and I'm not going to recoil. I'm not going to stop it. You know what that's called? Repentance. I just realized I did the right thing in the wrong way. And I'm not going to change my mind because this is of God. This is of God. And what am I going to do now? Put you over him. I can't do that. You're now his servant. That's just the way it's going to be. And it goes all the way back to the prophecy that was given to Rebecca that the older would serve the younger. It's exactly what God said would happen from the beginning in Genesis 25, in the previous uh, two chapters ago. And the Lord told her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. I wonder if that's why Rebecca kept him close, knowing that she couldn't trust Isaac because Isaac was going to favor Esau. It's interesting. It says Esau, Esau was loved by his father because of his manliness, because he'd go out and go hunting, and he enjoyed eating that wonderful food he made him. It just says that Rachel loved Jacob. doesn't tell you a reason why. Just Rachel loved Jacob. You know, if you're going to love somebody, unconditional is the way to go. So Esau's weeping. He's seeking a blessing from the father, but it's too late because in his previous years, he's despised this blessing. He wanted nothing to do with it. He sold it for a bowl of, of, of lentil soup. He could have held out for a steak, but he didn't. He doesn't care about these spiritual things. And now all of a sudden, now when his father's on his way out, now he cares about spiritual things. He just wanted the money. He just wanted to be favored. Matthew 7, to 23, Jesus says these words. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I take a warning from Esau. If you're going to be about the flesh and you're going to be about yourself and you're going to live your life that way, at the end, don't go looking for God's mercy because you're not going to get it. Somebody who just, yeah, okay, God, whatever, and despises him all of their life and they leave this body and they stand before him, it's too late. Esau is crying and weeping bitterly for a blessing that he'll never get. I hope no one within the sound of my voice ever has to do that before the living God. And say, Lord, please forgive me. He's going to say, you had a chance. And two and five and 10 and a million. And you said no. Because that will be the end. The scripture says it's appointed unto a man once to die. And then the judgment. There's no reincarnation. There's no second tries. There's none of that. Today is the day when you can make it right. Today is the day when you pay attention to the things God reveals. And you change. And God will bless you with eternal life because of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? That's the picture I see of Esau weeping, somebody who came too late. In Hebrews 12, it talks about Esau. He begins by saying, therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame, is, uh, what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. This is a word to any Esau. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. 
looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Notice we all fall short of the glory of God, but the grace of God we're all eligible for, but we have to receive it. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator, any profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Repentance is for the living, not for those who die. Salvation is for those who turn to Christ while you can. And I see this to be a great example in the scriptures. How about you guys? You have people that you love and that you care about? You should tell them what you know. Don't keep it a secret. Because all the tears at a funeral aren't going to change things. But your words, while someone lives, may. And then Isaac... His father answered him and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth. That's similar. And the dew of heaven from above. That's similar. By your sword you shall live. That's different. And you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Interesting prophetic word. There's going to be a time when the people of Esau will break free from the people of Jacob. And so Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. And then I will kill my brother Jacob. I feel better. I'm going to kill him, the rat. In Genesis 25, 23, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people will be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. We see that that prophecy came true. By the way, this one comes true as well. There's a time when the people of Esau, the Edomites, they're actually under David's control. It's in Samuel. I don't know if I put it up here. I did, 2 Samuel 8, 14. He also put garrisons in Edom throughout all of Edom, and he put garrisons and all the Edomites became David's servants, and the Lord preserved David wherever he went. There's my proof. I'm so glad. I just think maybe you'll believe me sometimes, but there it is. <laughs> Hebrews 11:20 gives us this little, there's this little snippet about this blessing that occurs, and he says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith. I thought he was deceived into it. But you know what? When he found out what happened, he repented. And he says, I'm not changing my mind. Right. And he did this by faith, that God worked this thing out. And it's interesting, just this little verse, it sounds like, you know, uh, Isaac was this great man of faith and uh, he was deceived into it. But he said that which God put into his mouth and he said rightly to the right one, regardless of what he thought. And the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. She's very bossy. <laughs> Arise, flee to my brother Laban of Haran and stay with him a few days. It ends up being 20 years. Stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him. Who did it to him? She's not taking any responsibility. What you have done to him. And then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day? In other words, why, why, why should I, I have to mourn the death of both of you? And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, like these who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be? There's some Jewish mother mourning going on right there. I can't believe he married those goyles. Forget about it. If you marry Goyles like that, forget it. I'm going to die. I should die. I should be gone. Just bury me now. 
I could see it. First, she says, there's a threat on your life. You're going to die, so you need to get out of here. You need to run. And I don't want you to stick around here because if you marry girls like these, these women that come into my tent, hey, ma, you know, they'll be the death of me. I, what, what good is my life? It's interesting. She says, you're going to die, and these people kill me. I, I define this theme in this passage. So Esau's angry. Can you imagine living with an older, angry brother and having to live in the situation and go about your regular, like nothing's ever happened, you know, nothing to see here. That's misery. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Shame on you people. You're, you're as bad as I am. It's a terrible thing. And there are ways, and by the way, uh, the, the end of the story is good. They do reconcile later, but it takes the death of their father. So that's where we're at. Next week, we're going to look at running away because Jacob is going to run away. But he's going to be found by God in the middle of his running away. The beginning of the verse next week, as the worship team comes up, in 28, it says, Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. So Isaac gets over this. And charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. That's because his wife told him that. Arise and go to Padamaram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there, the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padamaran, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. That's how we're going to start out next week. So dad's okay with what happens. In case you were wondering if, they, if he actually knew what was going on and repented, he does. And he gets over it. So we'll talk about that next week. Mm -hmm.